All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Very excited about our Bridge to Brilliance program today. We are coming to you live via the giant UHV satellite hovering over Victoria to transmit this very special program. We have Constance Philly Johnson with us today, our criminal district attorney for the Victoria County. We'll introduce her in just a moment, but one of the things I love most about Bridge to Brilliance is that it gathers together in a great way students, faculty, staff, not just from UHV, but we have some folks joining us from Victoria College as well. And then we've started to see a lot more community members. So I want to especially welcome and thank our community members, people like Mr. Robert Crawford and so many other fantastic community members for joining us. This is one of our very, very favorite things to do each month. And we hope as we get into next fall, you'll continue to join us for these Bridge to Brilliance programs. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Woodrow Wilson Wagner, and I serve as the Director of Institution Programs here at the University of Houston, Victoria. I also have the pleasure from time to time as being a lecturer of political science and communications. So I welcome former students, current students. We have a number of political science and criminal justice students who are joining us. We have a number of faculty members in criminal justice and political science who are joining us. There will be some people, Ms. Johnson, who will use this later, this recording in their class, and it creates such fantastic assignments and discussions. So we're so very pleased that you're able to join us today. So for everybody online, just a few ground rules. If you can please mute your microphone, you can certainly keep your camera on and you'll have the opportunity to ask those questions later. But if you can please mute that microphone and certainly you can keep your camera on if you would like. You can certainly type things in the chat if you have questions and we'll certainly get to those in a bit. And then at the end, if you'd like to ask your own question and turn on that camera, you can do that. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce the host for today's Bridge to Brilliance. I'm very excited to say that today's Bridge to Brilliance is being done in cooperation with our student group, our nonpartisan student group called AFAL, also known as the Association for Future Advocates, Leaders, and Lawyers. And the vice president of that organization has graciously agreed to be our host today. Many of you have seen her before around campus at other events. She is going to be a fantastic advocate, a fantastic professional in her own right, as she's getting ready to graduate in May from the University of Houston, Victoria. I want to introduce her now, Miss Christy Henry. Christy Henry. Thank you so much for that welcome, Mr. Wagner. We are so delighted today to welcome criminal district attorney Constance Philly Johnson to our Bridge to Brilliance series. After graduating from UHV, she began her career as a BISD teacher and eventually became a safe and drug-free schools coordinator. She trained thousands of area educators in topics such as substance abuse recognition and prevention, conflict resolution, and gang prevention. Additionally, she implemented peer mediation and peer assisted leadership programs for area youth. Ms. Johnson's extensive experience in local schools provided her with a solid foundation for her career as a lawyer. For 13 years, she worked with her father, George Philly, in a private criminal defense practice. She served as president of the Victoria County Bar Association and founded the Victoria County DWI Court. While in private practice, she served as a municipal court judge for the city of Victoria for two terms. Ms. Johnson has been a member of the Victoria College Police Academy Advisory Council for the past 15 years and regularly teaches at the Police Academy. She is a past president of the Victoria Main Street Program and the Wood High 4-H Group. She currently serves as board member of Hope of South Texas. Ms. Johnson was sworn in as criminal district attorney in 2019, where she continues to serve. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Constance Philly Johnson. 
Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. We're so happy you're here. You know, when I was reading your biography, I was really impressed with all the different avenues in which you've served others. But, you know, focusing on your current career, I was curious about what inspired you to pursue this career as a district attorney and what qualities you feel make a successful one. Well, uh, so my dad was the criminal district attorney here in Victoria County throughout my childhood. I was a fifth grader when he was elected, and he served until I was 27 years old. So I, I kind of grew up in the office from the, uh, you know, the outside looking in and certainly was always very proud of the work that he did. And, uh, you know, I took sort of a circuitous route back to this role, having been a, a teacher and an educator in different avenues before, certainly coming back to this. Uh, but I, I think it it just takes a person willing to do the job in the right way. Uh, you know, some of the things that I, I think that we'll be talking about over our time together are, are real important in the way that I, you know, administer the role that I'm in. And, and so looking forward to sharing some of those things with you. Yeah. What is your proudest achievement as a prosecutor? Well, I'm very proud of the team that we have assembled since I've come into office in 2019. We have uh, nine uh, assistant district attorneys. Many of them, actually all except for one, were born and raised in the area. So we have a, a hometown group of people that are very invested in our community that take the job that they do very seriously. And uh, they have really had some tremendous accomplishments, both in the courtroom, in jury trials, but also in disposing of, of a thousands of cases, actually. I think the last time we looked at the numbers, our team uh, in the first term had, had worked through about 10,000 cases with felony and misdemeanors. And so personally, my, my proudest accomplishment for a case that I handled um, myself in, in the courtroom was last summer. I had a two-week jury trial and prosecuted a person who had worked in one of our local schools and had abused a number of uh, the students under his care for a number of years. And so I had 11 very brave uh, victims of that crime come forward and testify in, in a courtroom about some terrible things that had happened to them. And that gentleman was found guilty and sentenced to more than 50 years in prison. And I think that that was the appropriate outcome, and I'm very proud of that outcome. Yes, for sure. You know, um, Mr. Wagner mentioned that um, AFOL is a nonpartisan student organization, you know, and so we, we really try to emphasize the importance of representing all viewpoints. Absolutely. And, you know, as a Republican office holder, how do you represent, represent those who don't share your political views? And could you talk a little bit about um, how you've transcended that partisanship to collaborate others who aren't Republican? Sure. Uh, certainly, it's no secret that I ran on the Republican ticket and many of my personal ideals align with the Republican platform. But the right thing to do in any job, certainly in, in a public service job, has nothing to do with what party you belong to. And so the right thing is the right thing, uh, no matter whether it's a Republican ideal or a Democratic ideal or, or whatever. Uh, and so actually, I thrive in situations where I get to visit with people that may not necessarily share my political viewpoints. I think uh, on many occasions I collaborate with other individuals and agencies in the community uh, just to accomplish the, the goals of upholding the law here in Victoria County for all citizens regardless of political affiliation. I think we, we continue to grow when we embrace viewpoints that are different from our own and that's that's a really important thing for all of us. Yes for sure you know um, as a, a criminal district attorney uh, you know you, you focus on the, the crime aspect and, and things, but what, you know, all of us here want to do our part to make our community a safer place. And so I was curious what you thought the best way that we as college students can prevent crime in our community. And how do you work with this community in Victoria to build trust in the criminal justice system? Okay, that's a great question. The first piece of that is how can you help us um, combat crime in the community as college students? Uh, anytime I visit with a, a community organization, I encourage everyone in the room to please, 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 please lock your car. <laughs> um, though, though some of you, I don't know, you know, the audience members, but many people in Texas, certainly in Victoria, uh, have 
uh, handguns, and they are lawfully owned. Many of us keep those in our vehicles from time to time, and it has been our observation in the law enforcement community that many of the uh, illicit guns on the street in the hands of the wrong people got there in the first place by being burglarized out of a vehicle. So I, I that's a, you know, some people are very aware of that. Some people that comes as a surprise too. So please, please, please lock your vehicles. Uh, if you do, of course, have a handgun, be a responsible handgun owner, bring it inside, uh, secure it properly. And so that's a big thing. Thing, not putting uh, guns into the wrong hands. That's a, that's a big one. Uh, second to that would be be aware. Always be aware of your surroundings. You know, be, be safe. Don't allow yourself passively to become a victim. And sometimes, uh, and, and I'm guilty of it myself, we get so engrossed on our cell phones when we're walking down sidewalks or we're in public places that sometimes we're not necessarily paying attention to what's going on around us. So just be aware. Uh, you know, passive people, people that aren't paying attention are, are very often uh, easier to victimize than people that are alert and that are looking around and paying attention to their surroundings. Uh, but, yeah, just talking to one another. If you see something, say something, speak up and, and be very often. We get some great tips toward the cases we're working on by concerned citizens that call in uh, to 911. They're, you know, following someone that they saw commit a crime or they know something and they've, you know, chosen to, to step forward and, and talk about that. And so that's very helpful to us in the law enforcement community. As far as building and maintaining trust uh, in the community in this role, I think the only way that I can ever do that is to continue to be open and honest with the public about, uh, you know, aspects of cases. Uh, sometimes that's a challenge. I will tell you. Uh, sometimes I catch flack uh, for for things that people don't understand about cases that have been disposed of in a, in a way. And uh, ethically, sometimes I'm not able to share some of the things that I wish I could that would give people a more um, a better understanding of why we chose to do what we did on any given case. But I hope that uh, when those occasions do arise from time to time, that comes with the territory. Criticism is part of, of being a public servant, and that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm built for that. But when those occasions do arise, I hope that people will look back to times uh, where I've been very open and very transparent, and, and hopefully those will, you know, those actions on my part in the past will see me through. Yeah, you know, I was curious for people that may not know, your, your time that you spent as a, a municipal court judge, and uh, can you kind of like compare and contrast it to what you do now as a district attorney? Because, you know, sure. it's both it's both law, but it's I don't know the, the different aspects okay. you know, to approach both jobs. You bet. So when I was the municipal court judge for the city of Victoria, I uh, presided over all class C tickets that were issued by the Victoria Police Department and other um, like animal control and things like that. Any class C citation and ordinance violation that would have occurred within the city limits of Victoria would come in front of the municipal court. And so I had the opportunity to be the person at the class C level. Many people don't know you're not required to have an attorney. And so many times people come forward when they feel like they've been issued a speeding ticket, for instance, and uh, they can um, advocate on their own behalf. And they would come to the, the court and, and talk to me about what the proper resolution of their ticket was. Uh, many times it was just helping people uh, learn how to take care of the citations they received or maybe warrants that they had out for them because of tickets they hadn't taken care of. And how to get their driver's license straight was a big part of the, the role back then. Uh, there were some things with... Uh, there were some fines and things like that that occurred. They've since been repealed, thank goodness. But it made people getting their driver's licenses cleared up sometimes very difficult. And so I really used that opportunity as a uh, chance to point people in the right direction to, you know, there's accountability. If you're not following the, the transportation code, of course, we, I've gotten tickets of my own and, uh, you know, there's a consequence for that, but it was helping people through that process and, and very rewarding, very close, up close and personal uh, contact with the public in that role. So as district attorney, I prosecute all cases Class C cases only that are issued in the county. We have a, an assistant district attorney specifically that handles those. And then all class B misdemeanor and above, so all the way up to capital felonies. And so I'm the person that prosecutes with, along with my team, of course, uh, those a little bit more serious than things that you would have seen in municipal court. So what do you feel that would be like is the biggest challenge as the district attorney? I mean, I'm sure that you've seen everything, all kinds of breaking the law. But I mean, how, how does that impact you as a person when you see these kind of like egregious crimes being committed? How do you know, you I think that? every person that works in this arena, whether it's, you know, 
law enforcement all the way up through prosecutors and certainly even defense attorneys that handle these cases, we see some, you know, very depraved things. And it's it's difficult sometimes to really not take that home with you. Uh, we have to be mindful of that. There's a lot of self-care and, and, you know, to keep ourselves healthy mentally, we see some terrible, terrible things. And, and um, you know, it's unfortunate that, that humans can be so awful to one another and do some awful things. But we also see the very best of people rising uh, from very terrible circumstances and being survivors of some of those things. And so it's, it's very rewarding at the same time, but uh, no, it is, it's certainly a challenge. And I, and I, I'm a secondary, you know, trauma, if, if you will, I'm not the first responder. So I really feel for rank and file level law enforcement that are, that are dealing with some of the worst things I've ever seen, you know, on the, on the front end, that's a, must be a very difficult thing to do. So what, what would be one of the biggest or biggest challenges facing the criminal justice system today? You know, we, we hear a lot about that in the news, but locally, what are, what do you think, you know, some of the challenges that, that we're facing? Sure. You know, I think today, post pandemic, there are many, um, types of careers where we saw a mass exodus of people. It seems as if some of the careers that had the most uh, public contact and some of the challenges for getting through those things during COVID, we've seen, you know, teachers and nurses and uh, law enforcement, of course. There are many people that just retired or chose not to come back to the workplace after some of the really challenging things that people went through during COVID. So with that, we are seeing an all-time high number of openings in the prosecution ranks across the state. Uh, our association, which is the Texas uh, District and County Attorneys Association has more openings than they've ever had. And so it's it's getting and retaining qualified people to, to do a very difficult but rewarding job. I've been very fortunate locally. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. I have worked very hard to recruit people with hometown ties. And so we've not experienced some of some of the same things that other offices have, but we, we have an opening right now that's been open for several months. And so that is a, a challenge across the, the board, whether it be law enforcement, corrections, or certainly prosecution. You know, one of the things that I thought was really awesome was that you founded the DWI court. And so I kind of was curious about, you know, not, not necessarily just with DWI, but in general, what do you think is the most effective way to rehabilitate offenders to ensure that they don't reoffend? Okay. Um, so I was one of several people. I can't take all the credit for founding DWI Court, but I was on the ground level of that as a defense attorney at the time. And uh, the it was the brainchild of Judge Laura Weiser. She and Judge Juan Velasquez at the time were the county court at law judges. That's been about 15 years ago. And uh, she saw a model at a conference and thought that would be a really good fit for Victoria County and asked me to be on the ground level of that. And I was delighted. And so what the research is very clear about is that people that are suffering from an addiction, whether it be alcohol or other drugs, um, you know, we we can punish them. Of course, we're, they, there's accountability for breaking the law. There always has to be accountability. But along with that, we have to get people the help that they need to reduce recidivism. Uh, if we never address the underlying addiction, they are never going to, to stop breaking the law. It's going to be a, a, a hamster wheel, if you will, a never-ending process. And so the really great thing about specialty courts is that it combines the best of both worlds. You have accountability for having uh, broken the law and also forced, if you will, uh, treatment options. And so so people are placed in outpatient treatment. And so while going through and, and, you know, making amends to society for having been convicted of either DWI or drug possession, we also now have a, a care court at the felony level for people that have drug addiction. It's very similar to the DWI court, but it combines uh, treatment with accountability to hopefully break that cycle. And uh, there have been some really fantastic strides in reducing recidivism for people that have gone through those types of programs. Uh, we UHV did a fantastic study of our own DWI court about two years ago, and our numbers even impressed us. <laughs> we were very proud of them because our recidivism rates were very low uh, for the people that had successfully completed the program as compared to people who didn't. So it's it's just you know really being smart about a attacking an issue that affects so many people unfortunately. I was curious, um, along that same line, you know, we, we've had a, a judge from Hayes County come and speak to AFOL, and she's a member of the mental health court. Yes. And so is that something that we're going to get in this community maybe in the future or has been discussed? 
So it has been discussed. We're certainly not opposed to that. We have limited resources. And so the same people that serve on the care court are the same people that serve in the DWI court. And it's, and it's many of my employees and employees from probation and things like that. So often uh, mental health issues go hand in hand with substance abuse issues. And so we have tried, uh, Gulf Bend is a member of our DWI court, for instance. And so we have seen that many of the people that are suffering with addiction issues are also having mental health you know, problems. And uh, so we're in, in our own way, sort of addressing both of those issues, dual diagnosis through some of those programs. Uh, right now, we don't have a, enough of a population for a standalone mental health court, nor the, the resources really to get one off the ground, but it's not something that, that I would rule out in the future. It's a, it's a very good program as well. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I think it's so important because you, you have to also address the whole, the whole person. And I think that's a great way to holistic, do that. Holistic approach. It's Fantastic. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Wagner, I, I noticed that there were some uh, questions in the chat. I didn't know if you wanted to go ahead and follow up with those. Yeah, so I think some of these came just based on y'all's conversation. So let's ask some of those. The first one comes, Constance, from one of our political science professors, no pressure, <laughs> Dr. Andrew Gross. And Dr. Gross says, the crossroads is a place where crime takes different forms. Given our geographic location in the state and in the country, do you work with law enforcement and prosecutors in the federal jurisdiction? Can you tell us about some experiences with that connection? I do very frequently. I have a, an excellent, uh, very open line of communication with the assistant U.S. attorney in this region. Uh, because of our location geographically, of course, we see a lot of drug trafficking, see a lot of human trafficking. Uh, and so sometimes, depending on the nature of the case, sometimes it's a better fit to allow the federal prosecutor to take over a, a prosecution. She has some, some options available to her sometimes that are better than the, the state level and vice versa sometimes. And so it's a case by case to Determination, but we have a great line of communication and uh, and our local law enforcement partners, you know, work with her just as well as they work with me. And so, no, we do see that on a pretty frequent basis, as a matter of fact. Now, I don't know if you can talk about this, but do they ever give you feedback in terms of the effectiveness of your group and their contribution to those efforts? Do you feel that you're an asset? Are you made to feel like you're an asset from the federal government? I do. Uh, and, and maybe it's just the individual assistant prosecutor. I don't know. But no, we're I, I, we're friends. We're colleagues. Uh, she's a, a fantastic lady and uh, is very respectful and, you know, works. We, we collaborate well together. And so, no, she is always very deferential to the cases. Uh, she does, you know, th there's no time nor room to be territorial when it comes to stuff like this. We want to keep our community safe hold lawbreakers accountable and do the right thing. And so if it's a better fit at the federal level, I'm happy to hand that case off. If something that she has works better at the state level, then she calls me up and, and we just take care of business. But no, we, we work well together. And my sense of that, and Christy and others can chime in on this, is that that kind of cooperation is a bit rare in our country and in our state. I think people are very territorial. They're very siloed, especially when you start mixing in partisanship to it. So I'm wondering if you could give our students and our, our other folks joining us today, what, what's in your makeup, your DNA, that you're willing to have the humility, because I think that's part of it, <laughs> to have the kind of trust to say, you know what, I'm going to collaborate with you. I'm not worried about Constance and her power structure and how good I look in the newspaper. But what what is it about? Was it something in your upbringing? I'm sure lessons learned from your father, because my sense of you, Constance, since I've known you, is that you're cut from slightly a different cloth than we see other district attorneys, especially in that relationship between local state or local and federal government. So. That's a big well, question, but I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I'm, I'm humbled, and thank you for saying that. You know, I've heard that more than once. I didn't think I was that unique in that regard, and, and unfortunately, maybe that is the case. Um, so my campaign slogan back in 2017 when I first announced and, and 
I ran on a platform of collaboration. Uh, my my little slogan, slogan rather, was working together, we can do better. And, uh, you know, in the past, perhaps it wasn't that way. And I saw that that was certainly an impediment to uh, efficient and effective uh, prosecution in our community. And I, I vowed I would do better. And I, I think I've done a good job in that regard. But no, we all have to leave our egos at the door. Check your ego because an effective leader is never going to be driven by ego more than they are their commitment to their, their duties and their job performance. So, you know, sit down around the table. Let's talk about it. How can we get the job done? And whatever that looks like is what it looks like. And, and sometimes we're redundant. You know, there's no sense in, in duplicating efforts. Um, and, and so we're, I'm just maybe a natural communicator. And, and certainly in my upbringing, the oldest of four children, you learn to get along. <laughs> you learn to figure it out or else. Um, and so, you know, and, and certainly I think my dad did a great job of modeling that as well. And um, no, that's it, it's got to happen. That's got to be the case or we're never going to get move forward. Now, let me ask you, and this isn't a crowd now I'm just going off on a tangent, but did the four H's have anything to do with that sensibility? Because I know four H has been a part of you and your family's identity for so long. And for those people who don't know the four H's, what are the four H's and how did those maybe inform that sensibility of collaboration? Oh, gosh, you're going to make me do a pop quiz on the four <laughs> H's. So head, hands, heart. And what am I missing? Um, no. Health. Don't forget health. Health, health of course. <laughs> um, no, that that is it's just good old fashioned work ethic. It's it's learning to be a, a steward of, of you know our resources. Certainly, kids that raise livestock and have chores and responsibilities and obligations are are, are good hardworking kids. And so I was raised in a you know family and in a home like that. And then certainly that was a very important part of my children's upbringing when they were young. Uh, and I've got a grandson and, and we're already talking about how we're going to remodel the pig pens for us so that he can do the same. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's chipping in, working together to get a job done and, and just being a responsible, productive member of society. Really, it raises great young people that, that many have become future leaders. And I, I suspect maybe you were as well by having asked the question. <laughs> Yeah, but, well, fantastic. your family and mine, we did. We crossed paths in the livestock show circuit. Absolutely. I think your sister especially. Sure. You know, always seem to beat us. There's, the Phillies always have something <laughs> special. But uh, it was something that now you do look back, Constance, and you think these things did contribute to the human being I am. Because I get the same kind of question. People say, well, why are you so nice when people aren't nice? <laughs> right? Why do you seem to like turn the other cheek? And Part of that, I guess, is a religious or spiritual thing, but Most part definitely. of it is just basic how you treat humans kind of yeah. thing. All right. Um, let's go to another question from one of our community leaders, C CEO, Mr. Hunter Follette, who's been a big champion of Bridge to Brilliance. Yes. Thank you for taking the time today. You're a real life superhero in my book, says Hunter. Oh. Excellent. Oh. Now you have to Hunter. get a costume, Constance. Hunter. You have to get <laughs> Superhero it's costume. Coming um, from Hunter, that's quite the compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> so Hunter asks, can you speak to some of the work we are doing locally in terms of criminal justice reform? For instance, in what ways are we using some of the concepts of restorative justice? Great question. Okay. Well, um, so I have two victim assistance coordinators on staff, one at the felony level, one at the misdemeanor level, and a very important part of, of many of the cases that we handle is inviting the, the victim of those crimes into our office for a sit-down meeting to just talk about the aspects of the case, where it might go in the criminal justice system, how that might look, whether they're going to testify, whether that's going to be necessary, and how can we make them whole. And sometimes, and, and one of the most difficult things to to share with people that don't work in this realm is that what we know and what we can prove are two different things. And so very often a case will come to our office that has all of the boxes checked, but we're missing an important gap uh, from an evidentiary standpoint. And there's not a thing we can do to overcome that. And so what we, our goal sometimes, if it's not going to ultimately be a successful prosecution that's going to culminate in a, in a criminal conviction, is to get the person, the resources and the help that they need to put them to Put the matter behind them. And so all day, every day, we want to do right by people. And that does not occur by, by 
conviction statistics or notches in my belt or anything like that. We want to make people whole when we can. And so uh, whether it's from a restitution standpoint, whether it's from a mental health and a counseling standpoint for the victims of those crimes, whatever that might look like, we do our level best to try to make people whole. And so uh, Hunter and I have sat down on, on an occasion. He came to my office, as a matter of fact, and I am so proud of the work that he is willing to do to help people that were formerly incarcerated find find their way in the workplace. He has been a champion uh, of that locally. And I think that's on the back end, another part of restorative justice, because if we don't give people the tools and the opportunities that they need to come out and live a productive law abiding lifestyle, once they've paid their debt to society, then we are setting them up for failure and they'll be right back where they started from. And we'll be seeing them again in my office. And, and quite frankly, I don't want that to happen. I want them to be successful and go forward. And so Hunter has really set the set of fantastic example of employing people that have come out of, of, of prison and, and jail and uh, given them opportunities to live a law-abiding and very productive lifestyle. I think that's a real important part of it, and uh, I hope more people follow his lead. And it sounds logical. It sounds moral. It sounds like what we ought to do, and we all nod our heads, but what are some of the realistic barriers, some of the roadblocks? And Hunter, sure. feel free to chime in as well that you all face in that effort. Well, certainly perception is a challenge, and I'm sure Hunter can speak better to that than I can. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, there are people that have committed crimes that are so egregious in people's minds that maybe coworkers wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable working alongside them. Or maybe there are certainly industries where people come into people's homes and, you know, you might have a customer that says, oh, no, 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 you're not going to bring that guy into my house. I, I get that. And so employers have to be mindful of that. And I'm, there's a balancing act to, to be had. But um, a large proportion of the people that come and go in the criminal justice system and that are incarcerated are people with uh, substance abuse issues. And and so if given the proper um, rehabilitative uh, opportunities, once they're clean, they're fantastic people, but but they've done some things and made some terrible mistakes in the throes of that addiction. And, and so really that we, I'd say three quarters of the cases that we handle have some aspect related to substance abuse. All right, yeah, Dr. Uh, with, Gross with and Hunter. Uh, yeah, Hunter, go ahead, it, sir. It, just to comment real briefly. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for the very kind words, uh, uh, Ms. Philly. Likewise. Um, just to, just to uh, just to, to kind of briefly, so I, one of the things, and thinking about our audience as well, uh, that I really respect uh, about you, um, uh, Counselor, is is uh, your commitment to not just a punitive justice system, a system that you know, a, as you point out, sort of thinks about substance abuse, and and I think that's one of the reasons that you know we've had some of the uh, low recidivism ra recidivism rates that we that that you, you mentioned earlier. Um, and I, I think just as, as we're thinking about the audience here and, and some future attorneys and, and public policymakers, uh, I would just encourage them to also take that sort of holistic approach and realize that, you know, may, may none of us be judged on our on our worst days uh, or, our, or, you know, for the rest of our lives. And, and after we've paid our debt to society, if we don't have a, a way to reenter society as a contributing member, we will reenter it as a non-contributing member. Absolutely. Um, so, anyway, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again for the time today. You bet. Well said, Hunter. Thank you so much for everything you do. So, Dr. Gross, was there any follow-up you had? Or hopefully Constance answered that. If you do have follow-up, feel free to chime in or write additional questions. But I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Christy. Christy. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm curious about the actual process of what you do. So, for instance, um, like what is the process for deciding whether to file charges? How, how is that decision made? Okay, um, so gen very generally speaking, right? Uh, it's sort of a twofold process. Uh, the intake attorney, sometimes that's me if it's a, a very egregious case, those come to my desk. Uh, and sadly, those are, are murders and sexual assaults and aggravated assaults and things like that. But I also have a fantastic staff who does intake on, on all the other cases that come into our office. But, but first and foremost, my duty in the courtroom is to prove each element of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. And so I have to look at that case in a vacuum and determine whether or not I have the evidence necessary to prove the elements of the case. And so that's a very non-emotional uh, evaluation of the case from a technical standpoint. And then even then, sometimes when I can prove the case, there are many instances where the second evaluation becomes, is it in the interest of justice? Is it the right thing to do? And so we have other avenues available to us, like specialty courts. We also have a pretrial diversion program that's 
focus is on young people. Uh, when we cannot create criminal records in our young people, if, if we can avoid it, that's a great thing. There's always going to be accountability. So a pretrial diversion process still involves, um, you know, necessary classes, perhaps, if there is a substance abuse issue, an alcohol issue. Uh, sometimes that's going to be community service. It's certainly going to include restitution if someone's been harmed in a way. Uh, but we have a lot of options available to us. And so we can never take a cookie cutter approach in evaluating the cases, we look at them, each of them individually on a case-by-case -case basis and, and make those determinations. And so, you know, once those initial uh, criteria are, are met, then it moves forward in, into the process. And Dr. Gross just asked, um, is, is there some general context in which a case should be taken up by a federal attorney or by your office? Um, so really, it's just the, the nature of the case. Um, most, sometimes the federal authorities have more flexibility when it comes to high uh, volume drug distribution, for instance. They have many more options available to them, uh, stiffer penalties at times for, for very dangerous people. Uh, and not to say that our office is certainly not capable of prosecuting those cases. We absolutely are, and we do all the time. But it's... it's um, kind of a, a collaborative process about what cases would be better suited uh, being referred over to the federal prosecutor. Sometimes law enforcement is comfortable enough with my approach. And now that we've worked through those scenarios many times before, they will give me a heads up that they may have arrested someone in Victoria County, but because of the nature of the case or the amount of drugs or the, the, the I don't know, there's a variety of factors. They're going to present that to the federal prosecutor. And by and large, I give them a thumbs up and tell them, great, let me know if there's anything we can do to help. Uh, but yeah, there's just some cases that are better suited uh, over in, in her arena than in mine. You know, you, you were talking about the collaboration, and I know that's a very important aspect um, of your, your job. Um, what steps do you take with law enforcement to ensure the successful prosecution of cases? First and foremost, we have open lines of communication. They know that they can call on me uh, any time of the day or night, and they do often. And so we talk. We talk a lot. They know our expectations. They know what's going to make a case successful at this point. Uh, you know, and, and anytime we see a shortcoming, we feel free to reach out, talk to them about that. And I mentioned a moment ago, sometimes we can overcome an evidentiary shortcoming. Sometimes we can't. Uh, but they are, I think, very comfortable talking to myself and the assistant prosecutors in our office, and, and they're very very committed to bringing us strong, viable cases. And so we, we communicate well, we're all working together uh, to, you know, ultimately to, to achieve the same result and the just outcome. Yeah, and it really takes both parties. Um, what is the most important thing for defendants to know about the criminal justice system? Okay. Well, certainly defendants need to understand their rights. We all have constitutional rights that we are able to avail ourselves of. And so I think local law enforcement does a good job of not trampling on those rights. And they certainly know that I would never tolerate that. Uh, but, but defendants can always have the right to, uh, you know, advocate. They need defense counsel on many occasions. Uh, and so you were talking about a very basic thing. You know, you've all seen on TV uh, the Miranda warning that a defendant, if they're arrested or if they're in custody, uh, have to be apprised of those constitutional rights before they're interrogated or before a search occurs or something like that. And so that really is on on rank and file law enforcement at the, at the investigative level. But then as far as when it comes to my office, I think that they need to understand that there's no vindictive aspect to what we do. We, we have a job to do. We're going to do it uh, in, the, in the best way possible. And it's not, uh, you know, I, I think you know enough about me now that I, it's not from a retribution standpoint, it's from an accountability standpoint. And so we're going to treat everybody involved in the system with dignity and respect and treat them fairly and, uh, you know, do, do the right thing by everybody involved. And I, I was thinking conversely, what do you feel like a victim needs to know? Victim needs to know that we're here for them, that uh, they they are contacted across the board by our office. We do that as a matter of routine. Uh, sometimes it's frustrating for victims, and I can certainly empathize with them. It's frustrating for them uh, when cases don't move along in the process as quickly as they would like for them to. And uh, that's one of our bigger challenges, of course. You know, COVID, we are better situated in many ways than many of our neighbors. Our criminal justice system continued to move forward by everybody working together. I've got to give a huge 
shout out to Judge Ali Garza. I don't know if he's on here. He said he was going to show up and heckle me, but I don't know if he, no. But he, we worked very well together and he kept our criminal justice system moving forward in the face of some very tough challenges that COVID created. But nonetheless, it did create some backlogs. And so we have victims out there, some, some that were victimized in a very egregious way that are waiting for their, you know, their day in court for their case to be resolved in a just way. And very often the delay is, is a really frustrating thing for them. And so I, I hope that they understand that we're moving through the, the system case by case as quickly and but giving each case the attention that it deserves and the diligent attention it deserves. And uh, we, you know, we're just doing our best. Yes, for sure. Um, we do have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, Robert asks, how long have you been practicing law? I've been practicing law since I graduated in December of 2005. And so I was uh, sworn in, passed the bar that following February and was sworn in in June of 2006. So 17 years, I guess, coming up on that. And then uh, from Corey, uh, the question is, what proportion of your legal training would you say happened at law school or on the job? And where would you say you got your most formative training? Uh, formative training is trial by fire. It always is, no matter what you do for a living. Uh, law school, of course, was a fantastic preparation, but you don't know what you don't know until you're in the trenches doing the work. And so, um, you know, some of my early days as a baby attorney, going to court and actually doing doing the job. My dad uh, was very blessed, was, was my law partner for 12 years before I ran for this office. And I, you know, I know that I'm not entirely biased, but I had one of the best mentors around. And so he taught me a great deal just by modeling and trying cases with him and, uh, you know, going to court with him and, and then doing those things ultimately on my own was probably more important in the long run than, than some of the things I learned in law school. But you can't discount the, the good foundation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we talked about earlier, you know, what we could do in our community to, you know, prevent crime and, and the biggest challenges facing the criminal justice system. But could you offer some suggestions for improving criminal justice, the criminal justice system? And uh, do, what what would those be? What do, mm -hmm. What do you see maybe some things that we could improve on? Well, I will say I need to give a shout out to anybody on on board or who has been familiar with the Victoria College's Police Academy, because the Law Enforcement Academy at Victoria College is head and shoulders above many in the state. And so very proud to be affiliated with that program as an adjunct professor and also having been on their advisory council for, for many years now. So the, the people that are being turned out into this community to, to uphold the law and keep us safe and, and serve us are fine men and women that are dedicated to serving the community and they're getting a fanta really fantastic basis for, for doing so at the Victoria College. So now with that shameless plug aside, I will say that, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we could do, and it's a challenge for us every day, I, I wish, and this is tongue in cheek, but, you know, every TV show about cops or about prosecution, I wish it came with a little disclaimer at the front that said, this is not anything like the real world. <laughs> because ultimately, we have jury panels that, that watch CSI and Law and & Order and Dateline or whatever. And so one of the biggest things we have to be cognizant of is that what, what people come in with, their perceptions of what criminal justice looks like and our abilities and our forensic capabilities and all of those things are based upon something that may or may not be realistic. And so that, that's tough sometimes, overcoming people's notions of what criminal justice ought to look like or, you know, compared to what it really does. Yeah, that, that was kind of my follow-up question. You know, like what, what would be something, what would you like people to know about what you do? Or, you know, what would be surprising for the average person to, to know, you know, of, about what you do? I, you know, I think one thing that I often find surprising to people is that um, if you had to guess, Chrissy, what, what do you think the turnaround time is for a DNA result? Once we have a, a swab from a violent crime scene and they send it off to the DNA lab, how long do you think it takes to get that back? I would think, I would think at least a week, two weeks. Okay, okay. So the answer is several months. Yeah, and that's even an improvement. When I first began practicing, uh, DNA results sometimes took well over a year to get back. And so that presents some some delays that are outside of my, you know, 
circle of control. And so people, especially people that are victims of violent crime, want those cases to move, and I don't blame them. But I'm at the mercy of getting all of the evidence back from the labs sometimes that I need to prosecute successfully. Sometimes uh, forensic evidence bounces around to different labs within the state. Uh, one, one lab may take care of, of GSR for gunshot residue, and then that same piece of evidence has to be mailed to another lab for DNA analysis. And so it might take six months at this lab and another nine months at this lab. And you can imagine, you know, you multiply that by several hundreds of thousands, probably millions of cases in the state. It's tough. And so the state uh, has done a better job over the years of, of putting more money into our crime lab system, but it's overwhelmed and it's, and it's much slower than we wish it was. How many, how many um, entities do you say co co collaborate on just one case? Because you were mentioning oh, it has to go here and there and things like that. Sure. So um, the last murder case I tried, I had um, a DNA expert. I had a ballistics expert. I had the medical examiner. Um, I had, um, you know, obviously all of the peace officers that were involved in that. I had civilian witnesses. And so it, it's not uncommon on a high profile case like that to have several dozen witnesses and, and probably, you know, half a dozen different agencies working together. To, and so coordinating schedules and all of those things, it's, it's a, quite, quite the orchestration. That's for sure. Mr. Wagner, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that, Constance, because I think you hit a really, really good point about how most people are conditioned by the media, especially the entertainment media, television shows, to think that these processes happen very, very quickly. Correct. And within an hour's time of law and order, <laughs> everything's solved, right? But I, I want to just kind of go back to that example of sending the stuff off. Is the amount of time that that takes is that due to the bureaucracy of it all, or is it just the science of it all requires time? So some of that is the science requires some time, but it really is a, is a funding issue. It's a resource issue. Uh, so the crime lab, the one that we use most frequently is located in Corpus Christi. I think there's more than a dozen in the state. I don't remember offhand, but it seems like there's about a dozen different crime labs throughout the state. And, um, you know, there's probably... I'd say we took a tour, so I know this firsthand. I'd, I'd say a handful of chemists that perform uh, analysis on, on drugs, for instance. There's another two that do uh, analysis on DNA. And so Victoria is one of dozens of counties that submit evidence to that laboratory. And so they are working sun up to sundown, you know, doing, doing the work. But there's just such a volume compared to the actual people that work in the laboratory. So they, they do what they can, but it, it takes, takes some time. And I think some people are under the impression that Victoria County has its own lab. Well, <laughs> <That's a facility. laughs> and all you you're just walking across the street, you know, to the courthouse, and you all got the lab. But that's not how that that's not how it works. So the sheriff's office and the police department have a crime scene unit, and there are people dedicated to gathering evidence, you know, according to best forensic practices, and then processing that evidence to the degree that they can in house and then submitting it to the to the appropriate lab. And, uh, you know, if, again, it's it's lots, thousands of, of agencies that submit things to be analyzed uh, by by a pretty small number of people. And it's just a resource challenge. But yes, right. most jurors are very surprised to find that find that out. Right. OK, two more questions. And I think these will probably be our last questions because we want to give you a time to kind of wrap it all up. First, during your first years, on the average, how many hours a day did you spend in the office? And what was the hardest part of your first year? I guess your first year as criminal district attorney. Okay, so if, if I'm going to be honest, and all, all of you that I, I just said the word self-care at the beginning, but do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> because <laughs> those first years, it was not uncommon to put in 12 and 14 hour days. And it, it felt necessary to me because I inherited somewhat of a backlog as well. When I came in, there were 600 cases uh, waiting to have intake done. And there's, you know, there, there are five of us in the felony department. And so 
we still have to read those cases and prepare them for the grand jury, prepare them for, you know, the district court process once those cases are true built. And we're still going to court every day. And so it's it's finding the time and finding the balance to get that done. And, and it was necessary to put in some really long hours uh, in the beginning. I still could work 24 hours a day, as many of you could in your own jobs, and you still would never be finished. And so I have, I'm doing a little bit better at recognizing that I have to cut it off go home, recharge, and start over. Uh, but yeah, that was the biggest challenge, kind of getting my feet on the ground, wrapping my head around the things that needed to be done. There were you know, some, some relationships that needed improvement uh, in law enforcement and some of the local agencies that have worked real hard to improve. And, and so we're there. We've, we've, we're all in a good place relationally, and now it's just, just plugging away at the work. All right, another one from Dr. Gross. The Texas legislature is currently in session. I know you know this. Yes, I do. If you had a magic wand, Constance, would, would you ask for a change in Texas law that would make the criminal justice system work better in some way? Or mm -hmm. do problems have more to do with the lack of resources, addiction problems, as you mentioned? So I don't know, Dr. Gross, that I would advocate for any law that's going to be the, the cure-all and it's going to improve anything. I do think it's a resource issue. I do think that many of the things that would serve us better, uh, we could spend a whole another session talking about mental health. We're underfunded. We don't have the resources we need for the people that need mental health services. We certainly, uh, I'm a huge cheerleader of Billy T. Catan Recovery in our community who has taken the lead on implementing a local inpatient treatment facility. That's something that our community has probably needed for decades. And now we're going to have one. Uh, and so that's a fantastic addition to our ability to help people break the cycle, be, you know, treat the things that are getting them involved in the criminal justice system in the first place. And so it's I my humble opinion is that resources are, would be more important than than a magic law. Well, Elena Torres wants you to know that you're a breath of fresh air. Oh. And thank you for all that you do. My pleasure. And thank your you. office in your office as well. Thank you. Thanks. And last question is going to come from Robert. Do you notice a substantial turnaround in the law profession? Are a lot of the people who you graduated with still practicing law? That's an interesting question. That is interesting. Um, as far as the people that I've kept in touch with, yes, they are still practicing law. You know, many people over time sort of take different paths and they uh you know, but yeah, as far as I know, most of the people I went to law school with are, are in the trenches, still doing the work. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. But I, I definitely see some burnout across the board, not just in the legal profession. And, and it's, you know, it's COVID shook us up. And we say it all the time uh, in-house and certainly to our grand jury members and things like that. People are are still recovering. We The illness, we may have gotten a handle on that piece of it, but uh, the, the impact that it had on, on people's mental health, certainly our, our young people in, in particular, uh, we're still reeling from that and we're going to be reeling from that for some time. And so that's that's certainly something we're cognizant of and, and continuing to, to combat. All right, in just a moment, I'm gonna turn it back to Christy, but before we do, Constance, we have a very special feature on Bridge to Brilliance. It's called This Is Your Life, Constance <laughs> Billy Johnson. And Gosh. you've already seen some of the photos, but I just want you to comment on, on, on some of these photos because they reinforce some of the points that you've already made and how important some of these things are to you in your life and in your decision making. There, of course, you are with a lovely plant. And what are we looking at here, Constance? Uh, that, that second, well, I, that was a boss's day nomination and I was oh. very honored by my staff to have won a drawing. So that was really sweet. Who is this photo of, or this portrait? Oh, that's, that's just a portrait. It's a, a pioneer Texas woman. And I kind of relate to her from time to time. <laughs> well, definitely. Uh, yeah. And a few photos, we're going to see how oftentimes you might be the only woman in the room. So you are oh, a pioneer of sorts. Have Very we fun. had district attorneys in Victoria County who were women before? No, we have not. I am the first female. You are the first. <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. What are we looking at here? So we sponsored a canine officer. This is the second uh, canine officer that we have helped the Victoria Police Department obtain. And so really proud to give local law enforcement the resources they need to do the job that they do for us, keeping us all safe and uh, doing the work. Well, I was what's happening here, Constance? <laughs> 
Well, despite the face I'm making, that was a really great event. I was welcoming the uh, alumna to the uh, School of Education after graduation at UHV last last May. And when did you graduate from UHV? In uh, 1993. So this is oh, my wow. 30th year after graduation. Excellent. And then I know this is a proud moment. And who are these humans in this photo? That's my mom and dad. That's at this year's uh, swearing-in ceremony on January 1st after uh, taking beginning my second term in office. So my dad- Is it true yeah. that your dad swore you in? That's him. That's what he's doing. It sure is true. Wow. Now your dad was district attorney in what years? Uh, he was elected in 1983. Uh, I was a fifth grader. He had been in the office as an assistant for some years before that, and he left office in 1998. So he was oh. in here for quite some time. And then is this your sister on the that end? That is my, my middle sister, yes, and my mom and dad again. That's at that same ceremony. So family's a big thing for you. And I know that just because I kind of know you, but this was one of my favorites, the multiple generations, right? You right. and your mom at the GOP convention. And I say, I think this is your daughter, correct? It is. It is. It's my daughter on her lunch break uh, voting in one of the elections last year. That is now, her. Will, will your children be going into the law as well? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> And the two generations is enough. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna break no, this they they have some different interests. Obviously, I'd be very proud if they chose that path one of these days. And that's the other thing. If we've got students on board, it's never too late to pursue a, a career, pursue a dream. I was in my 30s when I went back to law school. Uh, so I was a classroom teacher and then an educator in a different capacity for 11 years before I went back to to get my uh, you know doctorate. So never too late. Continue. You know, we evolve, and and I would encourage anybody to jump in if it's something that you want to do, just go for it. Now, this guy didn't get the memo that this was a mother-daughter photo, so we can just <laughs> Photoshop him out. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just cut him out of there. And then this is a cool photo, your parents. And then who is this gentleman for people who do not know? That would be Governor Abbott. He was in Victoria for a, a fundraiser, and we were invited guests. So got to got to say hello to the governor. Now, this was the one I was thinking of where the sea of men, right? We're all <laughs> fantastic, honorable men. We've got a couple of county commissioners here. We've yes. got the mayor. We've got Judge Zeller and, of course, the governor. Sure. And then there she is. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, a fantastic moment. It, it, and have you forged a good relationship with the governor and his office? Uh, I don't know personally. I, I mean, maybe if you reminded him that I'm that DA down <laughs> in Victoria, he might. I don't know that he knows me by name, but no, he's uh, he's got programs, of course, uh, grants, specialty court grants and different offices under him that we work with a little more frequently. But but no, I think in general, I, I have a good relationship with with state state law offices and, and leaders. Now, why is Commissioner Sexton the only one wearing a hat? Why isn't it everybody wearing it? We all need maybe, to wear <laughs> Maybe no one else got the memo. I <laughs> have you worn hats at public gatherings? One time. Okay. I, I did have a, a hat. It wasn't quite that style, but I did wear a hat to a, a, a gala of Okay. Year. Well, our crack researchers are going to be researching that later for the photo. <laughs> we'll see the all right, so that is our This Is Your Life. I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Christy Henry for a little bit of recap. Ms. Christy Henry. We are so grateful that you came and shared your time with us today. I know that I'm a pre-law major, and so this has been very interesting to hear about what you do and how it intersects with advocacy, which is what I want to go into. So I, I really appreciate that. I was curious, as kind of like a final note, what advice can you give UHV students, because you know your career did start here, and Absolutely. look at all you've done. That's very impressive. So, um, yeah, what what final uh, words of wisdom do you have for us? Just keep learning, keep growing, keep evolving. Uh, and again, I, I think I mentioned it a minute ago. It's never too late to pursue a different avenue, or or to fine tune some skills and some knowledge base to improve the the path that you're on. And so I'd I'd say keep on, keep it on. Thank you so much. Do you mind if we share your contact information if somebody maybe wanted to reach out? Not at all. Okay. No. Well, I will I will follow up with that on that, but we thank you so much for coming. Thank and you so for I the invitation. You. I've enjoyed it very much. I appreciate you. Mr. Wagner, do you have any concluding uh, any thoughts? 
Sorry, I wasn't on. Okay, I just wanted to conclude by thanking Ms. Constance Philly Johnson. If you haven't got to meet her in person, I'd highly encourage you to meet her in person at some point. She comes to a number of our UHV events. She's at Innovation Collective. She's all over the place over town, and I'm sure she'd be more than happy to sit down with political science students sure and criminal justice students to talk about what you're thinking about, what kind of career path you might be going on. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please, please, please take advantage of these great opportunities to talk to people right here in our midst. In other big cities, you don't just get to meet the district attorney every day, right? And that's one of the great advantages of being in a place like Victoria and a place like UHV is that we've got these close connections with our leaders. So thank you, Ms. Constance Philly. I know I will be seeing you again soon at something fun. And you we'll probably be eating. We'll probably be eating something. I, we probably will. <laughs> so I want to especially thank AFAL, our student organization, the first political science organization at UHV, which I think is a great, great honor. And our vice president, Ms. Christy Henry, They've got contact information as well. If you're interested in joining AFAL or being part of their events, you can call that number. You can text that number. You, they're on Instagram. They're so cool and hip. I'm not on Instagram. Maybe I should get on Instagram. But that is, that is a fantastic organization. Future advocates and leaders and lawyers. And I think Christy in a special way, because I think we can all agree she is going to be a future advocate, leader, and or lawyer, or maybe all three, right? So Christy, it was so phenomenal, the questions you ask. And I'm sure Constance is writing down your name later when she needs to interview people. So it's so yes, great to see this kind of synergy happening. Thank you all for joining us. I know you got a lot of things going on in your life today, but I really appreciate you spending this hour with us. Please look for more exciting Bridge to Brilliance activities in the future. We're going to have more speakers in the fall and maybe even do something a little bit in the, in the summer. But thank you all for taking this time to spend with us. Really, really appreciate it. Until next time, I'm Woodrow Wilson Wagner coming to you live from UHV. Have a good evening, everybody, and God bless.